1970. We've only just begun. Well, this poster from 1970 is certainly very groovy, is it not? I love it. And floral designs were very in at this time. When I was first thinking of a title for this talk, I admit I was rather short of inspiration. I knew I wanted to focus squarely on the year 1970, but I needed a snappy title. But it just wouldn't come. At first I thought, into the 70s? And then um, the dawn of the 70s. Mm, these were okay, but rather pedestrian. Then inspiration struck. We've only just begun by the carpenters came into my head. I checked and it was first released in the United States in August 1970. The song um, originated as a TV commercial for a bank in California and um, it was a huge hit for the Carpenters in the US. Surprisingly, it peaked at only number 28 in the UK singles chart, but it's grown massively in popularity since then. It's a beautiful song, full of lush melody and precious optimistic hope for the future, made all the more special by Karen Carpenter's warm and tender vocals. And I suddenly realised it would make a great title for this talk. As you'll see, 1970 was very much a year of endings and beginnings, particularly the latter. A new decade had just begun. The Beatles were just beginning their solo careers. And this was the year that Edward Heath began his premiership, riding high on the hopes of a better tomorrow, to quote his 1970 election campaign slogan. Well, what was life like for the majority of the population as we entered the 1970s? Despite economic crises, British living standards had risen during the 60s. Historian and TV presenter Dominic Sandbrook documents the rise of consumerism reflected in the widespread acquisition of electrical goods. To quote him, by 1971, 64% of families owned their own washing machine, 69% had a fridge, and more than 90% had a television. Now, it should be noted that a significant amount of people would use a form of credit known as higher purchase, HP, to pay for things in those days, or they would simply rent their television set from firms like Radio Rentals. But the main point is that most people enjoyed greater affluence than ever before, as the real costs of electrical goods were falling. A Daily Mail article of May 1972 highlighted the rise in living standards using figures from market research. In order to earn the price of a 19-inch black and white television set, the average British worker would have had to have worked 200 and 208 hours in 1961. By 1971, this figure had fallen to 85 hours. Now, I don't have precise figures relating to the year 1970, but this was the trajectory that most people were on at the time. They were turning to purchase more and more material comforts for the home. What of the general public mood in Britain as we began a new decade? It's very difficult to generalise. If you didn't live through this time, but you have a general appreciation of what an exciting time the 60s were, you might feel envious of those around at the time. By common consensus, the 60s are seen as a dazzling decade full of fizz, a time when Britain had led the world in terms of pop music, style, design and fashion, and in films too for a time. Plus, there were many sporting achievements. People were enjoying their accruing home comforts, as I've mentioned. But of course, the British public in December 1969 were well aware that all was not right with the world. 
On their television screens, they had seen the terrible civil war and famine in Biafra, the US bombing of Cambodia, the terrible carnage in Vietnam, and the sectarian troubles in Northern Ireland. Racism was very much a live issue in Britain in 1970. Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech of 1968 was still reverberating as Powell remained an active player on the political scene. One could detect a yearning for traditional values and growing worry about crime and violence. I can remember that even the generally cosy police series Dixon of Dot Green began to get more gritty around this time. There was a greater degree of violence shown even in that series and this was disturbing to my grandparents as I, as I recall it. On the other hand, this was a time of great historical and scientific achievements with widespread, with widespread appeal, such as supersonic flight with the rolling out of Concorde, which had its first test flight in March 1969, and the first moon landing in July 1969. So these events gave rise to a feeling that everything was possible. One of the most remarkable and attractive features of 60s culture was the incredible, seemingly unstoppable optimism of much pop music, beginning with the Beatles' breakthrough in 1963, and it was an optimism that carried on into the early 70s, despite all the ugly things occurring in the world. Pop culture did reflect changing times, with darker tones creeping in, reflected in the late 60s output of the Rolling Stones. But the dominant mood music of the time was best summed up by tracks such as The Age of Aquarius from the musical Hair. It was a supercharged optimism which was very potent and powerful. Well now let's just uh, remind uh, or familiarise ourselves regarding the chief figures of this time in UK politics. Um, incumbent Labour Prime Minister since 1964, Harold Wilson, and leader of the opposition and leader of the Conservative Party since 1965, Edward Heath. They were two very different personalities. Harold Wilson was classless, man of the people, he loved HP sauce and Gannix raincoats. Um, he had flat northern vowel sounds. He was witty and entertaining with acute political, political instincts. Edward Heath was posh sounding, but from a humble background, he was the son of a builder and a maid. He was a highly accomplished musician and sailor and rather awkward socially. Impressionist Mike Yarwood was hugely popular in the early 70s and he would have great fun sending up Wilson with his homely catchphrase referring to Mrs Wilson, Oh Mary, come and have a listen to this. And with Heath's tendency to grin widely and shake his shoulders vigorously when he laughed. But politics was, of course, a serious business in reality, as we shall see later on. I'm going to introduce a new story now. Apollo 13. So Apollo 13 was the third mission in the Apollo space program which was meant to land on the moon. The mission was commanded by Jim Lovell with Jack Swigert as command module pilot and Fred Heiser as lunar module pilot. And I expect many of you are familiar with the film Apollo 13, in which Tom Hanks plays Jim Lovell. The mission was launched at the scheduled time, 2.13pm Eastern Standard Time on the 11th of April 1970. However, however two days into the mission, an oxygen tank in the service module ruptured. This prompted the famous phrasing used by both Swigert and Lovell. Houston, we've had a problem. The lunar landing had to be aborted. It was now a question 
of getting the astronauts back to Earth alive. The crew had to transfer to the lunar module, which they used as a lifeboat. The limited power caused the crew great hardship and NASA engineers had to improvise using inspired methods in order to conserve power. There was massive worldwide interest in the incident. Harold Wilson's personal message sent to US President Richard Nixon on the 14th of April was diplomatic, sympathetic and helpful. So he's saying here, I was deeply concerned to hear the news of the setback to Apollo 13. We all realise that in these highly advanced and technical missions, the unforeseeable can always occur. Our thoughts are with you during these anxious hours and we all look forward to the safe return of your astronauts. If we can be of any assistance, please let me know at once. Our forces throughout the world are at your disposal should you feel that they can, can help in any recovery operation. And here we can see uh, a, tele a telegram message from President Nixon back to Harold Wilson and he's saying, Dear Harold, I wish to express my deep gratitude for your kind expression of concern and your generous and timely offer of assistance in the recovery of the Apollo 13 crew. Should circumstances require it, we shall be in touch with you about necessary arrangements. Richard Nixon. Um, yeah, so there were some redeployments by ships by the Royal Navy to assist with the splashdown if it was needed. But by the 16th of April, um, it was apparent that this contingency wasn't needed. Instead of visiting the moon, the crew looped around the moon and they returned safely to Earth on the 17th of April. Wilson sent a heartfelt message of congratulations to Nixon and um, he, he refers to the tributes paid here in Britain to the courage and endurance of Commander Lovell and his crew, um, which are matched by the tributes to the remarkable technological achievement of the Houston Control Center in their handling of the situation. And here we see Nixon's reply I'll just read you the last couple of sentences. I was deeply touched by the worldwide concern which the disabling of the Apollo spacecraft evoked and by the many offers of assistance we received. We have been strengthened in our feeling that in exploring space we are indeed representatives of all mankind. Now some people might be cynical about these sentiments but the Apollo missions did have the effect of bringing the world together in global village moments with massive interest in the televised coverage, particularly of Apollo 8, Apollo 11 and the one that went wrong, the Apollo 13 mission. Well, it was all happening in April 1970 and we must now move on to contemplate the end of the Beatles, the group which dominated the 60s. To quote Ian MacDonald from his book Revolution in the Head, The Beatles Records in the 60s, agreement on them is all but universal. They were far and away the best ever pop group and their music enriched the lives of millions. But sadly, the year 1970 marked the end of the Fab Four as a collective though there are some qualifiers to be made to that statement, as we shall see. Here it is, in all its stark glory, Paul McCartney's writ, issued on the last day of 1970, a lawsuit against the other three Beatles in the High Court of Justice, which is located in the Strand. The plaintiff is James Paul McCartney, and the defendants are John Ono Lennon, George Harrison, Richard Starkey and Applecore, the Beatles Company. 
a sorry document to behold for any fan of the Beatles. Essentially, the lawsuit was brought with the purpose of dissolving the band's contractual partnership. Paul McCartney was suing his fellow Beatles. How had things come to this pass? When it comes to pinning down a date for the breakup of the Beatles, it's actually difficult to pin down because it wasn't a clear cut process. Some people will point to Paul McCartney's press release of the 10th of April 1970, but the real split was initiated by John Lennon at a band meeting on the 20th of September 1969 at the headquarters of Apple, when he told McCartney, Starr and business manager Alan Klein, Harrison was not present, that he was leaving the group. He, Lennon, wanted a divorce. That was how Lennon described it. A new royalty, a new royalty deal with Capitol Records was due to be signed, so Klein convinced Lennon to keep the split secret. That was seen as being in everyone's interests. Lennon went on to make some ambiguous remarks in media interviews, which to coin a phrase used by McCartney in this context, kind of left the door open to the Beatles recording together again. But McCartney didn't hold out much hope of this. In the winter of 1969, he went into seclusion with his new family at his Scottish farm. He was saddened by Lennon's departure. He began work on his solo album, McCartney. Once you get into the detail of how the Beatles disintegrated, some of the matters which receive attention may seem like small beer when taken out of context. There were lots of other factors swirling around which explain the increasingly poisonous atmosphere which developed, though I'm not going to venture into all these muddy waters here. There are dangers with accepting the hearsay which has been passed down in the last 50 years. This is why Mark Lewison is the universally respected world authority on the Beatles, because he places primary sources at the centre of his research and talks to hundreds of authentic witnesses. Anyway, I shall continue with my summarised version of events. Once Lennon, Harrison and Starr became aware that McCartney was planning to release his solo album on the 17th of April 1970, simply entitled McCartney. This was seen as a problem as there were existing products on the Apple release schedule. The Beatles album Let It Be and Starr's first solo outing, Sentimental Journey. On the 31st of March, Starr went to McCartney's house to tell him of the decision to delay the release of McCartney. Paul, act, Paul reacted badly and Paul's album was put back on the release schedule for the 17th of April. McCartney was bitter over this episode and as we shall see he was also highly critical of Phil Spector's treatment of one of his songs on the Let It Be album. On the 10th of April McCartney issued a press release which was distrib distributed to select journalists with advanced copies of the McCartney album. It was a series of questions and answers. There were some ambiguous or non-committal responses from Paul about the future of the Beatles, but a key question was, do you foresee a time when Lennon-McCartney becomes an active songwriting partnership again? To which Paul answered, no. Nothing in his answers amounted to a definite, definitive statement about the Beatles' future, but the international press interpreted the comments as an announcement that the band had broken up. There were headlines such as, Paul quits the Beatles, McCartney breaks off with Beatles, and the Beatles sing their swan song. Paul's remarks further antagonised his bandmates. John described it as, Paul causing chaos. Paul wanted to, be f wanted to be free of Apple and the Beatles business manager Alan Klein, who he had never been keen on. Paul had wanted Linda's father as manager. 
And in the end, it seemed, the only option was to sue his bandmates to uh, bring about liberation from Apple and Klein. If you're wondering about the image here, this is the B-side of It Don't Come Easy, released in 1971, big hit for Ringo then. And um, early 1970 is a poignant track. Ringo ho hopes that the other Beatles will play some music with him when he's in town. At the National Archives, we hold um, the proceedings of the case, which began in the Chancery Division of the High Court on the 19th of January 1971. Um, there's masses of documentation about money wrangles and that poignant song on Abbey Road, You Never Give Me Your Money, came into my head while I was looking through the documents. What you're seeing now, uh, this is, um, so David Hurst was the counsel acting for Paul McCartney. And um, I'm going to read you this extract. It's uh, quoting from Paul's letter, which he sent to Alan Klein on the 14th of April, 1970. Dear Sir, in future, no one will be allowed to add or subtract from a recording of one of my songs without my permission. I had considered orchestrating the long and winding road, but I decided against it. I therefore want it to be altered to these specifications. One, strings, horns, voices, and all added noises to be reduced in volume. Two, vocal and beetle instrumentation to be brought up in volume. Three, harp to be removed completely at the end of the song and original piano notes to be substituted. Four, don't ever do it again. Signed by Paul McCartney. Yeah, well, Paul felt very strongly about this matter, as you can see. He regarded um, Phil Spector's orchestration as intolerable interference in his work. On the 12th of March 1971, High Court Judge Blanchard Stamp found in McCartney's favour and a receiver was appointed to receive the assets and manage the business. Now we move back to the political narrative and I'm going to backtrack a bit to put the situation in context. From the spring to the early summer of 1969, the political prospects for Harold Wilson um, were looking very gloomy, but then a recovery got underway. As Wilson's biographer Ben Pimlot explains, this was due to two main factors. Firstly, the government was perceived as doing well in its handling of the Northern Ireland crisis. And secondly, the economy started to improve. In September 1969 came news of a large rise in exports. And by December, the balance of payments showed a surplus of £440 million. The confidence of Wilson and the Labour Party about their electoral prospects was significantly boosted. Wilson's approval ratings in opinion polls gave him a huge lead over Edward Heath. Chancellor Roy Jenkins resisted calls for a giveaway package of measures and instead presented a cautious budget in April 1970, and this was well received by the public. Local election results on the 9th of May were good for Labour, leaving the Prime Minister purring like a Persian cat in the words of Barbara Castle. Now it was all about judgment. When would be the best time to call an, call an election? Should he go for a June election or keep going until the autumn? Wilson and some of his ministers were mindful of the risk factor of the World Cup being played in June, but the greater worry was the danger that inflation might well surge upwards by October. On the 14th of May, Wilson told his inner cabinet that he had decided to call a general election for the 18th of June and all his ministers agreed. The first three weeks of the election campaign went well for Labour and Wilson was a real crowd pleaser. 
he was brilliant at dealing with hecklers, cracking jokes and exchanging banter. The weather was unusually good. No rain fell between the 18th of May and the 11th of June, and there was plenty of sunshine. In the words of Ben Pimlot, the Prime Minister toured the country as if on a holiday outing. And here I'm going to do a slight detour, but it's all relevant to conjuring up the national mood at this time. The rock band Mungo Joy ascended to national, indeed international fame in 1970. They had had a huge impact at the Hollywood Festival on the 23rd of May. That's not Hollywood in Los Angeles, but Hollywood in Staffordshire, Newcastle under Lyme area. Anyway, they were on a bill with Black Sabbath, Traffic, The Grateful Dead and others, and they went down a storm. Um, you know, maybe some people in the crowd were a bit stoned, um, but they were certainly woken up by Mongo Jerry and the organisers invited them back for the next day. Um, by the way, that sort of picture that you can see there on uh, one of those singles, I believe that is Mongo Jerry performing at that festival. Now, they had just released their first single in the summertime. And on the 6th of June, this entered the charts at number 13. The following week, it went straight to number one and it stayed there for seven weeks. This was the song of the summer that year. You couldn't get away from it. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It begins in the summertime when the weather is hot. You can stretch right up and touch the sky. It's a mixture of skiffle and Latin American rhythm with an infectious riff. Interestingly, there are no drums on the track. They didn't have a drummer. They just stomped their feet. The song was written by Ray Dorset, lead singer and guitarist. He with the huge afro, massive sideburns and large grin. If you can put aside some dreadful, highly dubious lyrics regarding women, which reflect the widespread casual sexism of the time. If you can, if you can just put that to one side, the song itself is exuberant, completely unpretentious and joy, joy, joyous celebration of life. And there was a ready appetite for this sort of back to basic, straightforward pop music at this time. Anyway, that was a little diversion. Back to the politics now and a gloomy note. On the 15th of June, the latest trade figures were released, showing a deficit of £31 million for May. Heath seized on this, arguing that Labour had misled the public, that there was an economic crisis. Some ministers were feeling jittery, but the press was still predicting a Labour victory with a sizeable majority. On the day before the general election, Tony Benn wrote, we should win by a large majority, certainly with a working majority. The optimism persisted up to 11.15 p.m. on election night when the first result came through from Guildford. I don't like the look of that swing, the Prime Minister said. It was 5.3% to the Conservatives. Tony Benn wrote, in a fraction of a second, one went from pretty confident belief in victory to absolute certainty of defeat. In terms of seats, the Conservatives won 330 with 46% of the vote, Labour 288 with 43% of the vote, and the Liberals got six seats. It was a crushing blow for Wilson, all the more so because such hopes had been raised. In terms of British politics, it was the biggest upset since Attlee's victory over Churchill in 1945. Why had the result turned out this way? How did Edward Heath triumph, seemingly against the odds? I should mention that Heath had ended 1969 on a high, with his terrific success in winning the Sydney to Hobart yacht race on his yacht Morning Cloud, and this had boosted his image and his confidence. Heath had campaigned with real vigour in the last week of the campaign. He looked smart, suntanned, silver-haired. As John Campbell has written, 
Heath was surprisingly good at personal electioneering in the streets or shopping centres. Heath concentrated on price rises in particular, and this cut through to the electorate. Douglas Hurd, who served as private secretary to Heath around this time, called it the shopping basket election. Two days before election day, Heath promised to cut the rate of inflation at a stroke. There was a large swing to the Conservatives and the opinion polls failed to reflect this. The day after the election, Harold and Mary began packing at number 10. Their sons, Robin and Giles, helped to put family possessions into trunks and tea chests. And as they did so, they played the Seekers single, The Carnival is Over, again and again, a fitting eloquy. As noted earlier, the election campaign coincided with the world in Mexico. And, and um, in the build up to this, there were high hopes for England, as demonstrated by the success of the England World Cup squad song, Back Home. This single began a new tradition that of the England squad recording World Cup songs as a celebration of their involvement. It reached number one on the UK singles chart for three weeks in May 1970. The song is stirring, but it's not triumphalist. It's all about making the maximum effort. We'll give all we've got to give for the folks back home. And another quote, back home, Though they think we're the greatest, that's what we've got to prove. I just couldn't resist singing that bit. So it strikes a proud but a humble note. In his Freaky Trigger blog, Tom Ewing has written, The song's particular pivot, it, though, is the gap and the link between the team and the fans watching in England. This neatly touches on something exciting about the 1970 World Cup. The England team had travelled to South America before, but only in the pre-Telstar days of radio broadcast. Now the folks back home would watch colour pictures beam live from the other side of the world, well, Mexico, at a time when the booming travel industry was bringing exotic locations tantalisingly closer. And certainly I can recall those fuzzy colour images on a, on a neighbour's colour TV set, particularly the yellow shirts of the Brazilian team. Well, as this wonderful image on the picture sleeve of the single shown here proudly proclaims, England were the reigning world, world champions at the time, having won the 1966 World Cup. In May 1970, the England team had flown out to Bogota, the capital of Colombia, to play a couple of warm-up games. Soon after this, Captain Bobby Moore was arrested and charged with stealing a bracelet from a hotel jewellery shop. It emerged that Moore would stay at the home of a Colombian football official, so he was under house arrest rather than being behind bars. Nonetheless, it was a very stressful time for him. Dennis Follows, secretary of the Football Association, urged Wilson to intervene in the matter. And here we see Wilson's response to this request from the FA. Um, so Wilson here, we were all greatly concerned to hear the news about Bobby Moore. Um, yeah, and he goes on to say, our embassy will do everything they can to help resolve this matter as speedily as possible and to safeguard Bobby Moore's interests and welfare. I have asked to be kept informed of developments and I will ensure that you are told the moment there is any further news. And on the 27th of May, uh, Dennis Follows has asked that the following message be passed to the Prime Minister. Um, he's saying delays in legal processes now becoming serious. Every minute's delay in securing Moore's release militates against England's World Cup chances. Request urgent action at highest level ends. Um, well, one can just imagine the effect of this message on Wilson. 
concerned as he was about possible consequences for the election campaign. As we know, election day had been set for the 18th of June, the day after the semi-final matches. The England captain maintained his innocence, and on the same day as this message was issued, a formal hearing showed that there were significant inconsistencies in witness stories. On the morning of the 28th of May, Moore was released, and he rejoined his teammates as quickly as possible. Foreign Secretary Michael Stewart paid this fulsome tribute to Bobby Moore, who by common consensus conducted himself in a very noble and stoical way, even though it must have been a very stressful episode for him. Moore was released under conditions. Um, so he wasn't cleared of the allegation of stealing the £600 bracelet from the jewellery shop in Bogota. And um, the Sun newspaper was certainly very angry about this. we shown here. Um, so when he saw this front page with its big headline, What a Foul, Wilson asked officials, can we do anything about this? The reply he got back was along these lines. The advice from the FCO is that we have to tread carefully. We'll do, we'll do all we can to ensure the case is closed. However, the case rumbled on until 1972. You can see there um, Tina Moore with their child. Um, well, I won't recount the uh, history of England's performance in the 1970 World Cup in any detail. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the wonderful uh, image of Bobby Moore and Pelé swapping shirts and showing mutual respect after Brazil's 1-0 victory over the Free Lions. England were knocked out of the tournament after they lost 3-2 to West Germany in the quarterfinal. Some believe that the psychological shock of this contributed to Labour's defeat in the election. So, back to the political narrative now, and Edward Heath was obviously delighted with his handsome victory, which gave the Conservatives a sizeable majority in the House of Commons, and the result was a huge boost to his self-confidence. He had confounded all the critics and pundits, but this may have led to a feeling of overconfidence in his own judgment. Like any Prime Minister, his first task was, a, was to appoint his cabinet, and its first meeting was on the 23rd of June. Here we see the first page of the minutes of that meeting with the list of attendees, and um, you may be able to make out there amongst the attendees, uh, the Right Honourable Ian MacLeod, Chancellor of the Exchequer, a highly capable politician. He was to die of a heart attack on the 20th of July, an event which shook Heath greatly. I'll also point out in that list of attendees the inclusion of the Right Honourable Margaret Thatcher, Secretary of State for Education and Science. These opening remarks by Edward Heath at the Cabinet meeting are highly significant. Heath had frequently attacked Wilson over the years for his use of gimmicks for new ministries such as the Department for Economic Affairs and, um, and for what Heath saw as meaningless phrases such as the infamous pound in your pocket speech following the devaluation of Sterling in 1967. In the election campaign of 1970, Heath stated, as a people we have been flattered and lulled too long by a trivial government. Well, this was his antidote shown here. So when he's addressing the cabinet here, he is talking about a new style of administration and a fresh approach to the conduct of public business. They should seek to establish a practice of deliberate and considered working, avoiding precipitate reaction to events and hasty or pre premature declarations of policy. Um, you know, there should be a clean break, a fresh start and a new method of administration. Um, it all sounds very orderly, but as we know, it didn't quite work out like that in practice with the policy reversals or U-turns that were to come later on. 
when Heath won the 1970 election, Cecil King, the newspaper proprietor and publisher, wrote in his diary, Heath is the hero of the hour, but how long will he remain so? He does not seem to realise the head-on collision with the trades union movement that lies ahead. This was a very prescient comment as Heath's government immediately found itself embroiled in a series of industrial disputes, beginning with a dock strike. A strike by power station workers in December over pay led to a state of emergency being declared and power cuts, and there was, of course, worse to come. A new story now. The Boeing 747 first entered service in January 1970 on Pan Am's New York to London route. And this advert for TWA 747 flights to New York appeared in the Egyptian Gazette of the 6th of September. But why does this cutting appear in a Foreign and Commonwealth Office file, complete with underlinings regarding revolutionary seats and promises of instant easy reservations? The answer can be given in one word, hijacking. This was a relatively new phenomenon in 1970, but this year, this year saw a dramatic occurrence of this. The ease with which people could book flights at short notice was one of the concerns that came out of this episode. On the 6th of September 1970, four aircraft were hijacked almost simultaneously by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP. One was an Israeli Boeing 707, which was en route from Amsterdam to New York. And this aircraft made an emergency landing at Heathrow, as reported in this telegram. It emerged that Israeli security guards on the aircraft had foiled the hijack, shooting dead a gunman and injuring a woman, Leila Khaled, whose hand grenade to blow up the plane had failed to explode. So, you know, obviously a very dramatic matter. Um, and uh, investigations are underway. A woman, a woman was injured. She was removed to hospital and after treatment was taken into custody. Two members of the crew were also injured. One seriously, as, as far as we know, no passengers were hurt. So the woman that was taken into custody was Leila Khaled. And uh, here is a uh, extract from another Prem 15 file. The front in Iman earlier said it would give the British government 72 hours to release the girl who has been identified as 24 year old Leila Khaled, the beautiful brunette who staged the spectacular hijacking of a TWA plane to Damascus in August last year. Remember I said that four aircraft were hijacked, so leaving aside the aircraft which landed at Heathrow, of the other three, one was an American Boeing 747 which was destroyed in Egypt after the passengers and crew had been evacuated. The remaining two aircraft, which were American and Swiss, had been flown to Dawson's Field, a remote desert airstrip in Jordan, some miles from Amman, formerly Royal Air Force Station Zerkwa. At Dawson's Field, the passengers and crew were reported to be under guard by armed Fed Dayin, who had attached explosives to the aircraft. The Fed Dayin were surrounded by the Jordanian army. Fed, Fed Dayin is a blanket term for guerrillas operating especially, especially against Israel. Their list of demands to the governments of Britain, France and Germany expanded over the next few, few days. But on this document, I'll just note um, A there in brackets, where it says the airplanes with the passengers inside them will be blown up if the Jordanian army, who are at present surrounding the airstrip, approach. Well, the International Red Cross managed to secure the release of 80 women, children and elderly passengers. When the Swiss Air and TWA aircraft landed at Dawson's Field, the PFLP discovered that none of the passengers they held were British. 
This was not conducive to their plans to use leverage over the release of Leila Khaled, who was being held in London, so they decided to hijack a British airliner as quickly as possible. So they duly hijacked or skyjacked a BOAC VC-10 on the 9th of September as it was travelling between Bahrain and Beirut. The files are full of dramatic telegrams and handwritten notes reflecting the urgency of the unfolding drama. So on this document you can see BOAC say a message has come 20 minutes ago from Damascus that the VC-10 was on approach to Revolution Airstrip. Um, and somebody's written there, that's Dawson Field, you know, so that's the terrorist name for the airstrip now. No injuries to passengers, the Prime Minister's been told. Um, so the British VC-10 joined the other two aircraft at Dawson's Field. And on the 12th of September, the remaining hostage, hostages, over 200 of them, were taken off the planes and in front of the international press, all three aircraft were blown up. You can see film of the destruction of these aircraft on YouTube and the, the images were beamed around the world and struck, struck a disturbing and chilling note. I can remember this from the time. We had entered a new era of terrorism where the stakes were being set ever higher. Heath, Heath stuck to the line that Leila Khaled would only be released when the hostages were safe and the, and standoff, the standoff continued for, for two weeks. Eventually a deal was secured. On the 29th of September, all the hostages were released and on the next day, Khaled was flown out of the UK in an RAF plane, which picked up six Palestinian terrorists en route, which were released from prison in Germany and Switzerland before taking them all to Cairo and to freedom. Although there was some criticism of Heath from, from some who perceived this as actually setting aside the rule of law in return for the release of the hostages, actually, as Heath's biographer John Campbell points out, even if Leila Khaled had been tried for the attempted hijacking of the Israeli plane, the, the likelihood was that that prosecution would have failed because of the difficulty of proving that the attempted hijack was committed over British soil. To be fair, Heath handled this crisis with great skill. There was a many other things going on in the year 1970, and there simply wasn't time to cover all these events, but they're certainly worth mentioning on this screen. Uh, if you just want to uh, cast your eye over those events. Well, before we close, let's return to one of my favourite subjects, pop or rock music. I feel I must give an honourable mention to Bridge Over Troubled Water, Simon and Garfunkel's final album, released in January 1970. The title track, with its beautiful message of compassion and hope, had a hymn-like quality, which is also true of the Beatles' Let It Be. To help mark the 50th anniversary of Glastonbury for a blog post earlier this year, I curated a Spotify playlist entitled Archives Gold, 50 Classic Chart Hits from 1970. What is striking about this selection is the sheer variety of music from this year. Pop, rock, soul, reggae, gentle singer-songwriter ballads and much more. The range is extraordinary from Close to You by The Carpenters to Paranoid by Black Sabbath. The charts were stuffed full of strongly melodic tracks which are well known and well loved by many pop fans today. And here are just, just some of them. And I must mention um, Rider White Swan, which entered uh, the top 40 in November 1970 um, and stayed on the chart for many weeks, Rider White Swan by T-Rex. It was Mark Boland's calling card, an indicator of what was to come. Up until the present, 1970 is the last Christmas in which snow fell on Christmas Day and thereafter. 
I know when people pour out of the Queen Vic in Albert Square on Christmas Day, invariably a full-scale blizzard is underway. But in reality, as we know, it's such a rare occurrence for snow to fall on the day itself. Well, that year, snow showers fed into the east on Christmas Day and then became more intense on Boxing Day and progressed west. The snow was widespread across Britain, cars were trapped and there was a good deal of dislocation. Kent and Sussex received falls of eight inches or more on Boxing Day. I remember this white Christmas in Penshurst, Kent, and it was magical. And so ended 1970, a year of significant and newsworthy endings and new beginnings. In Britain, the 70s were set to unfold with sequins, flares and industrial and economic crises.